So what is Draper? Huh, hold your answers. We're gonna ask the question again at the, at the end of uh, Jerry's talk. Uh, you enjoy the tour of a Draper. Uh, so how many of you would like to work at a place like that when you graduate from college? Raise your hand. All right, that's a, that's a majority. That's fantastic. So it is uh, my great pleasure to introduce Jerry Wallace, who is the president and CEO of Draper Laboratory. Uh, he received his Bachelor of Science degree from University of Kansas and received the master's and PhD from MIT Aeronautics and Astronautics Department. Uh, but more importantly to me and to us, he's been just fantastic supporter of BWSI for the last six years while he was at BAE and now he's at, he's at uh, Draper. So with that, let's welcome Jerry to this seminar series. I'm gonna ask this opening question. Humanity's greatest technical achievement, what is it? And there's no right or wrong answer and I'm gonna limit this to the last 200 years. So fire, wheel, put that out. Lisa. Uh, Transis Transistor. Transistor, yes, it's on the list. I can't reorder the animation though, but yes. Somebody just put air conditioning. Air conditioning. <laughs> I agree. Um, iPhone, internet, um, landing on the moon. Landing on the moon. Number one in most list. I think it's nukes. Nukes? Well, so we will get to that one, but. Medicine. Medicine on the list, yes. Plumbing. Plumbing. I think we can go back to the Romans for that. Maybe indoor plumbing. Others. Kind of missing a really big one. Yes. Telephone? Not on, yes, it's on the list, but not that it's prominent, yes. Batteries? No. Combustion engine. Combustion engine. Go ahead. Internet. Already said that. Lights. Uh, that would be in that category. Yeah. You know, not too, you know, Edison. By the way, first long distance phone call is right around the corner. If you didn't know that it was long distance from Cambridge to Boston, but it's on the plaque right on Main Street right here. So come on. How did some people get here? Cars. Public transportation, definitely not Boston. Plane, aircraft. All right, airplanes. All right. Okay. Now, why did I, so again, there's these, these lists have been debated over and over again. There's no right or wrong answer, but why did I highlight these five? What's that? Dra well, Draper cares about it, but yes. Yeah, national security, yes. Ah, Draper played not just a role, but I would suggest a critical role. So let's start off with the first one. There is the proposal cover for the Apollo program from 1961. Now, the truth is, is that at that time, we had launched the submarine, the first below water ballistic missile was launched from a submarine prior to the president declaring that we needed to go to the moon that decade. So President Kennedy was on a ship and observed the first ever missile come out of the water, ignite and go somewhere in the world. Now, Draper wasn't planning on going to the moon back in 1961. They were going to Mars. And the nation said, how about we just make one simple stop on our way to Mars? And that became the moon. On the right side of this is the first contract for the Apollo program. So the first contract let by the government was to Draper. So the overall architecture of this uh, program, and then as I'll show you here, and what Draper was really known for at that time, that went back to World War II was inertial measurement, All right? So in my cell phone today, 
when you wiggle the screen, you know how that screen wiggles? That's a gyro, right? Draper invented that. And it's actually in a silicon-based product, and we're going to talk more about that. So now, let me tell you about dreaming big and a crazy idea. Here is the cartoon that Draper had on how we we're going to go to the moon. All right, here we go. The Apollo spacecraft will consist of three modules. The command module will carry the three-man crew together with guidance, communications, and life support systems. The service module will contain propulsion systems for mid-course maneuvers, as well as for entering and escaping the lunar orbit. The lunar excursion module will carry two crew members to the surface of the moon, along with scientific instruments, communications, and guidance systems. It also will have a propulsion capability for a lunar landing and for return to the orbiting command and service modules. In Project Apollo, Saturn's first stage will provide seven and a half million pounds of thrust from five F-1 engines for liftoff and initial powered flight. The second stage will develop one million pounds of thrust from five J-2 engines to boost the spacecraft almost into Earth orbit. At the proper predetermined time and position in the Earth orbit, the S-4B will be reignited for propelling the spacecraft into a translunar trajectory. A few minutes later, staging will occur. The S-4B will be separated, fairings will be jettisoned, and the lunar excursion module will be repositioned to a nose-to-nose -nose attitude with a command module. Preparatory to acquiring its lunar orbit, the spacecraft will be reoriented for deceleration. Two members of the crew will transfer to the lunar excursion module through the hatch at the connection point between the two vehicles. After preparations are completed, the lunar excursion module will separate from the command and service modules, which will remain in lunar orbit. The lunar excursion module will be properly oriented, and its propulsion system will transfer the vehicle into an elliptical orbit suitable for approaching the lunar surface. The vehicle will be reoriented for landing. Then, through a carefully blended combination of manual control and automatic systems operation, the vehicle will be lowered toward the lunar surface. The crew will fire the lunar launching engine at a precisely determined instant to enter a transfer ellipse calculated to rendezvous with the mothership after traveling part of the way around the moon. After proper orientation, the lunar excursion module will complete the docking maneuver. Now, is that not a ridiculous idea? Can you imagine that, again, from 1961, we're going to go do this, and they did it July 20th of 1969? It's kind of ridiculous. So now, back to this picture here. And here's some of the realities of crazy ideas. So I talked about the guidance system, which was Draper's bread and butter. But how many people know about this guidance computer? Tell me. Ah. So here's the computer that changed the world. So Draper invented the silicon-based processing chip. Draper invented the digital computer. Did Draper intend to develop the computer? No, but it needed to be done to go to the moon. Because at the time, there was this thing called vacuum tubes. And I know that none of you have seen it unless you've seen it in the museum. But when I grew up, in the TVs we had were, no kidding, glass tubes that were about this big. And those were the transistors inside there. And to go from a hardware analog to a silicon-based digital, Draper had to invent that to go to the moon because the tubes were too big, too heavy, and they would not have survived launch. They would have shattered and broke. So as an inventor, here's the reality. You've got this big vision. You want to go do something really cool. And then you realize, oh, boy. There's a gap in that architecture. Guess what? Get up, go get it done. So this is the computer. So Intel was producing memory chips. Draper developed the technology. 
transitioned it off and the many, many things that Draper has done. Now, Draper also invented software because there was no such thing back then. Software actually were fabric threads in the original prototype. That's where the word soft came from in the software. They were fabric threads. Okay, and then this happened. So I think five successful missions to the moon surface, and then nothing happened, All right? So we're gonna come back to nothing happening. So Draper just celebrated, and you guys were in our auditorium for those people here in, per, uh, in, in person, the people online, a uh, little difficult. But we just celebrated our 50th year as an uh, independent nonprofit and 90 years as an innovation laboratory because Draper used to be part of MIT. And in fact, Draper was a laboratory called the Instrumentation Lab um, all around uh, Cambridge. It got consolidated. And all of these national security laboratories broke off from their respective universities during the Vietnam War. Um, Bob works at Lincoln Labs. Lincoln Labs and Draper actually divested nearly the same time. MITRE Corporation, well before that, because they were supporting the Air Defense Network. And you can go research laboratory after research laboratory that is either federally funded, like Lincoln Labs, uh, University uh, uh, Research uh, Center, like APL, or a nonprofit status. And the reason why we were nonprofit is that we were actually building guidance systems, producing them. Uh, primarily not just for NASA, but we were doing that for the nuclear arsenal. And then it, in our atrium, you, what you saw is that here's 90 years of innovation. So now let me go back to a couple of the, the pictures. Um, I don't have it in this one. Uh, in our, oh, it's here. In the 1972, you see digital fly-by-wire. So when Neil Armstrong came back, he had a digital fly-by-wire system in that lunar module. So historically up to there, space would always be, there would be a ground station, you would see where the, the spacecraft was, and then you would send your guidance from the ground to the spacecraft, and then that thing would report back. But during the Apollo era, there was a concern because there was a space race, and the space race was against the Soviet Union. There was a concern that the Soviet Union were going to jam our uplink downlink to the Apollo service module and lunar lander. Therefore, autonomy had to be, this word, new word autonomy, had to be part of the Apollo program. So Neil Armstrong had a autonomous spacecraft with ability to do manual control, and he actually did manually land it. But he came back and was like, why don't I have this in all my aircraft? This thing is the best system. So, Neil Armstrong, and that's why NASA Dryden, when I worked there, it was called NASA Dryden, it's now called Neil Armstrong, NASA Neil Armstrong, came back and started the digital flyby wire programs for two key reasons originally. One was for next generation fighter aircraft. And out of that, we got the F-16, which was an unstable aircraft in longitudinal axis, and we got the stealth fighter. Neither of those aircraft were possible without digital flyby wire. On the commercial aviation side, it has what has taken commercial aviation to the safest form of transportation in humanity. It is the safety systems on those aircraft that prevent aircraft accidents. And we used to, again, when I grew up, I was old, there would always be a um, airline crash about once a month. When was the last one? And look at the millions of people and the millions of miles flown globally. And it rarely ever happens. So for anyone in a car, all those safety systems, it's the same technology. And Draper was the inventor of it. Very closely here with the, uh, MIT. Uh, the next one I'll jump to, so I talked about the uh, um, submarine launch ballistic missile. Let me talk about vaccines. So, and this is on the upper far right here, and you see lung on a chip predicts COVID-19 antiviral response. So, as I was researching the divestiture from MIT 50 years ago, I came across that Draper was actually um, 
doing research in what has become biotech. It wasn't even called biotech 50 years ago. So during the pandemic, Draper had learned how to take organ tissue and make it really believe it's in a human body. If you do a Petri dish, right, which is what the medical community has used for centuries, there's a problem with that. A Petri dish doesn't have a heartbeat. It doesn't have the environment of the human body. And without that, that organ tissue, this oversimplify this, believes that it's in a dying body, not a living body. And it responds differently. So one of the issues with drug development, whether it's a vaccine, a therapy, and so on, is that they're testing those drugs in Petri dishes, and the organ tissue believes it's dying, not living. And therefore, you get a completely different response. So Draper was able to determine how to get organ tissue and take any organ tissue you would like and keep it alive in 3D with a human heartbeat with all the right friction, with all the right surrounding area to where it really believes it's in a human body. And we can keep that tissue alive for weeks and months on end. All computer controlled, no different than sending a spacecraft to the moon. So with that, during COVID, instead of having everyone being poked and seeing what happened, Draper rushed this and you saw the biological laboratory we have in the facility. There's a high-end one in central Massachusetts where the COVID vaccine is stored. And Draper's scientists were able to go. And first, they were able to infect it with the Omicron variant and then try all the different therapies to see whether or not it was going to damage that tissue before a human ever received it. On the flip side, then they were able to use vaccines and start testing the new vaccines. And this is an array of, for which you can have 96 different lung tissues representing the worldwide population, or you could apply 96 different variants per test for the vaccine or the therapy. And that's just all within the last couple of years. All right, so you can see this nine decades of innovation. You saw it on our wall in the atrium, on our webpage, we got this heritage. A little about Draper today, pretty small laboratory. Lincoln Labs is actually bigger than Draper. Um, APL is much bigger, right? So most of the laboratories are far bigger uh, than Draper, but this gives you an idea of where we're currently at. Nine campuses spread across the US. We will be double, doubling the size of our employees here um, this decade. So we just announced this sort of, again, I was brought in as I, for those that were here for the pre-session to restructure the laboratory. And this now kind of presents the vision of where Draper is headed. At Draper, we solve humanity's greatest challenges. As innovators, disruptors, scientists, and engineers, we develop technology and solutions to solve the next life-critical mission. With 90 years as precision problem solvers, we're building on our legacy to protect our customers and the nation. Leveraging our multidisciplinary approach, we drive innovation across four areas to advance security, provide extreme reliability, and high precision accuracy. We improve public health and safety, and prevent, detect, and respond to emerging biological issues for our national and economic security. We deploy advanced technology for precision sensing, guidance, navigation, and control, hardened instrumentation, and mission autonomy. And we pioneer novel technologies that enhance mission effectiveness in an increasingly complex world. Draper is transforming and shaping the future one bold step at a time going beyond boundaries and planets and the depths of the ocean to serve our nation's interests. It's part of our DNA. It's what drives us. It's what defines us. Draper Next, Unlimited Possibilities. Okay, so a question that was asked at the end that I deferred is, what does Draper focus on? We focus on these 
four markets. Strategic deterrence. So if you look at the top two, that is what Draper is known for. So as we sit here today, ever since we've had nuclear strategic deterrence in the nation, Draper's been there because Draper has developed the guidance system for every single one of the missiles up to this moment in time, every single one. This is actually almost the same solution and very similar to, to what went to the moon and back. We're gonna talk more about space next. We touched on electronics. So again, if you look at Draper, you don't think Draper as electronics powerhouse. But in order for us to do the different missions we do, we have to have electronics and the electronics do not exist anywhere in the world. So Draper designs and develops what's called strategic rad hard electronics for the nuclear inventory. So all spacecraft, if you're uh, above the radiation belt, has to have some protection against solar flares. Draper provides protection against solar flares and in the event that someone detonates a nuclear weapon, electronics still work. It's a whole nother level. Um, and then there's just a lot of exquisite, very rare electronics that Draper builds that no one else in the world produces. And they're all for our national security strategic missions. And then biotech, I talked to you about organ on a chip, but we currently have in testing a cure for cancer. It's a cell therapy-based approach. Uh, very, very different than any of the big pharma. We work with all the big pharma companies, but it is a guidance and control problem still of now it's DNA and it's genes within the blood. And we are targeting now synthetic genes and DNA to go alter your blood. So the cure for cancer that we're developing that's under test would take your blood one pint. It would then analyze your cancer, not a generic cancer. It would develop then the gene modification that your body won't reject and will attack your cancer. We then merge the two of them and then we reintroduce your blood back into your body. That's under test today. The results we have uh, received so far is that we are way ahead of any biotech company in the world in the ability to do this. We have the artificial lung. So if you go back to COVID and those respirators, right? The respirators did more harm to a lot of people than COVID actually did. So we actually have, again, something that from an IV, can go into a microfluidic and we can oxygenate it and put it right back into you for, to replicate your lung function. So now, what skill sets do we hire? We are mission focused. Whatever the mission is, we hire the skill sets. And it really doesn't matter. I would be shocked if we don't have political scientists on our payroll. I'd be shocked. I know that within our functions, we absolutely do. Right, but I'm talking within our engineering discipline. So what you just heard is that we've got a non-trivial group of biologists and chemists that work at Draper, right? So there is no limitation to the people we hire. We hire anyone that suits the mission that has to be done. All right, so my I heard from Bob that you guys wanna talk space. All right, I've got my Artemis T-shirt here, right? So. I'm going to now do the deep dive. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, Darren Co, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Mm, sorry. So uh, I just wanted to know, like, how did Draper stay? Darren Co. Wait, can you hear me? He wants to know, how did Draper simulate the heartbeat and other environmental factors to fool the tissue to believe it was a living body? Yeah, so we put real blood flow through it, and we literally have these little micro pumps. And because there's uh, the forward pressure and the back pressure when the heart beats, and you've got all of the friction within the blood itself, but also in your veins, we've been able to replicate all of that. And it's through a whole series, it's a control system. 
that uses a lot of estimation theory, right? And you're finding, you know, really controlling a series of pumps to create what appears to be the blood. Because when the blood pumps, it goes forward and then it retracts a little bit. It goes forward, retracts a little bit, right? And the ability to fully replicate that is through a series of a bunch of nano pumps at the cell level. It's pretty cool stuff. Okay, deep dive into space. So I've got a video and then we're gonna talk about Artemis. At Draper, we solve humanity's greatest challenges with the moon as humanity's next frontier. We are building on our legacy to develop mission essential capabilities with improved technology and solutions developed by the smartest and brightest in the industry. Engineering the fastest research and development to fielding cycle in the industry. Deploying advanced technology solutions for precision sensing, guidance, navigation, and control, hardened instrumentation, and mission autonomy. We shepherd complex research and development to support humankind's desires to surpass the boundaries of our planet and its orbit. From advanced and autonomous guidance, navigation, and controls to fault-tolerant computing design, we create solutions that enable space exploration. From outer space to inner cells, wherever engineered solutions are needed, Draper is there because the next frontier will extend our reach and our vision even further. Our deeply talented pool of scientists and engineers develop first-of-a-kind systems, allowing us to reach deep into space and beyond, and win the race to protect our democracy and serve our nation's interests. <laughs> We watched when Neil Armstrong took his first step, and Draper's guidance navigation technology helped find his footing. Now, as the race for the new space is reignited, there are new players in the game. Leading the pack is Draper, pushing past boundaries and delivering solutions, changing the future of space, engineering the next solutions for tomorrow, one step at a time. One atom at a time. Draper next. Unlimited. Okay. Do you want to do the question now or do you want to cycle back? Sorry, I, I just wanted to ask about that um, artificial um, heartbeat and if it could actually be used like in a real person or if it could have applications for that. Oh, to replace the heart? Um, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know that we've looked at that or not. I mean, you've got quite a bit of artificial hearts already. Um, I've kind of lost track though with all of that. So, but I'll go ask the question. All right, to the moon. So why is the international community going back to the moon? We've already been there. Why is it important for us to go back to the moon? Yes. Ding, ding, ding. All right. If you notice this picture, the moon is in the foreground, but you see Mars. So part of the reasons why we got to go back is because we actually want to go back to the vision that Draper had in 1961, which is we're actually going to go colonize Mars. All right, so now, why is the moon a nice intermediate step to go to Mars? Yes. Boom, less gravity. Anyone have an idea of what? How much less gravity? One sixth. Yep. All right, so less gravity now. So if I got less gravity, what am I gonna do at the moon to take advantage of that less gravity? Yes. Okay, less fuel, keep going, We're right behind you. Bench more, you can, probably about six X. 
Yes. All right. All right, you guys have clearly studied up on this already. So what I just heard was, why don't you just build the spacecraft at the moon? Did I get that right? All right, so how am I, what am I gonna, where, where, where are the supplies coming from to build a spacecraft at the moon? Go ahead. Yeah, the moon. So why are we going to the moon again? Right, and to mine the moon. All right, now, rock, let's go back to the rocket propellant. What's the first thing I need to establish on the moon if I'm going to have rocket propellant or anything? Go ahead. But before I can do a space station at the moon, if I'm going to mine on the moon, what must I get? All right, I need an oxide, an oxygen. And where do I get that from? All right, up there. Yeah, water. And where's there water on the moon? At the poles. All right. Has, so clearly some of you have heard this. All right, let me ask you another quick question. Why is another reason why the international community must go to the moon and go quickly? Yes. No, it's not about population, yes. Nope. Think political. Huh? Show off. Yeah, probably. Go ahead. Nope. Um, online, somebody said before four years, Mars window to find resources, rotation, land. We have lots of answers online. Yeah. No. Say that louder. Correct. That, uh, and that's, that's not a joke. So the challenge we have right now is when Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon, Neil Armstrong did not claim the moon as all prior explorers have done for the United States. What did Neil Armstrong do? For the UN, claimed the moon for humanity, the United Nations. And the challenge we have here is that um, China has expressed a direct interest in violating that and claiming it as their sovereign territory, just like the South China Sea. That's also an important reason on why there's a lot of pressure to get this done. Okay, so let's talk about Artemis. Um, I was actually at Johnson Space Center last week. It was pretty cool. They showed me these graphics and I'm like, well, I gotta get those. So I went online and I got these graphics. Um, I got to be in mission control for the space station, which was pretty cool. And I was shocked with how much Johnson Space Center has of prototype hardware right now preparing for the colonization of the moon. Shocked. All right, this just happened, Artemis 1, right? How many in the room, show of hands? I know I can't do this online. Show of hands, how many people tracked this mission? All right, that's not a lot of people, right? Clearly with the Artemis t-shirt on, but it, it is strange on how little media this program is receiving. Very, very strange. So um, we sent the capsule, Orion, around the moon, splashed down. Draper was involved in every single step of this mission from the guidance, from the launch pad to the moon, back to splashdown, right? Draper continues to support NASA, Johnson directly, just like we did the Apollo program. So now let's jump to Artemis II, 2024, right? So this is the first crewed mission, and but they will not land on the moon. They will start to demonstrate in that crazy cartoon where the capsule flips around, right? Proximity ops, they'll actually demonstrate all of that, but they will have done everything but land on the moon at this stage. And then we're gonna fast forward to 2025, Artemis three, and this will be the first landing on the moon since I believe 1972, December of 72 would be my November, December timeframe. Now notice 
What's going on at the moon? Look at that strange orbit. Does anyone know what's going on there? Yes. What's that? Yeah, so we will use moon's gravity, but why such a strange? Because we could just gone into elliptical orbit. You heard in that, right? You heard that that silly cartoon earlier about the elliptical orbit. We couldn't go on a circular orbit, but look at that orbit. Isn't that strange? Yes. Part of it is to set up for the poles, right? The other thing, which is pretty wild. So again, this is Artemis three. But here's Artemis IV. And look at that strange thing in the orbit around the moon. It's a cartoon here. Ah, that's right. It's the how many people know that we're building a space station for around the moon? Show of hands. All right. So Bob didn't know that last week when I asked him. <laughs> so the that silly cartoon is actually going to be a little different going forward. So this is the gateway space station that we will be building around the moon. And what you'll see, uh, I got on the, this next chart here, you'll see we'll re really build it over four, five, Artemis four, five, and six. But in this particular orientation is that what we will do is we will send crewed vehicles up to the space station and they will dock with the space station after 24 years of the International Space Station. We've kind of got this down. And waiting the crew will be the lunar lander. And that's what's on the back side. And this space station is completely configurable. So you see Orion, that's the, the four crewed spacecraft. And then on the bottom, you see the lunar lander. And in fact, with this, the lunar lander will be a sustained lunar lander, and that lunar lander will establish the first outpost on the moon, is that lunar lander will actually go back and forth, back and forth. So how are they going to do that? Well, they're actually going to resupply this, right, with fuel. And it's going to be done all autonomously. So if you kind of look at the makeup of this, this space station will be highly reconfigurable. And again, this is after 24 years of doing the International Space Station. We've kind of reached that moment. And what you also see here is that the international partnership that has been established with the International Space Station will continue on for Artemis. which now takes us to the overall Artemis program is more than human exploration. It will also, during this entire period of time, be delivering all kinds of robots to the lunar service, right? And there's a whole variety of programs. So there will be rovers that are fully autonomous that will actually be doing work continuously on the moon, even when the humans aren't present. Draper is actually the prime contractor for this mission. And this is when we deliver the first science experiments for the mining. And we are scheduled. If you were in our atrium, we had the little display, hit the red dot, the Schrodinger Basin. We're supposed to land. There is a crater on the bottom. And then there's a crater inside the crater. It was like a double hit of an asteroid. It's pretty cool. We're going to land in the rim between the first mountain range and the second mountain range. Now, every moon landing up to this moment has been done in a plane, as flat as can be. And uh, if you were watching the news, iSpace, one of our partners, attempted to land into a crater uh, just in March, and um, we hit the surface pretty hard, right? Taking off and landing, is not like taking off and landing in LA or Boston, right? Our runway configurations, everything, our air traffic control has all been standardized throughout the world. None of that has occurred yet on the moon. All of that standardization is required. So starting actually in, I think it's um, 
this year, subject to launch vehicle, we start to deliver the unmanned systems to the surface. There will be rovers. I actually saw a robot um, that you know looks like. I mean, I'm not kidding you not. It's like Star Trek, right? They actually the robot is operating in Johnson Space Center today. These are robots that will be able to like bionic robots that will be able to walk and maneuver around the moon. In addition to vehicles, in addition to mining equipment, the list goes on. All of this starts to be delivered to the moon is, and, and this year, right, with the initial what's called uh, CLIPS missions that are supposed to go there. So this stuff is not that far, right? And if you go back to this one here, 2028, you have the space station around and you now have regular visits of astronauts going to the moon and going to the moon surface. So now let's fast forward to when are we going to start being in there every day, like we've been in the International Space Station for 24 years. This is the mission. Uh, so Artemis 11 is 2035, and that's when you have what would be considered the permanent outpost of 24-7 humans on the moon. Questions? Yes. Ah, yeah. So we have developed the new rocket. This picture here on the right is the SLS, Space, uh, space Launch System. That is uh, the first configuration, right? That's what went already, propelled us Orion to the moon. There's the second configuration, which includes cargo. So what you'll see here is there's an annotation. If you can see this, um, oh, it doesn't tell you, but it's the second version, it's the Bravo version, because every single time we put an Orion up, it will also have cargo. And then there's the block two. And the block two is actually sized for full cargo to the moon, but is the same rocket that will take us to Mars. And Mars is a six month travel time on this rocket. So the rocket's already been built and it now will be upgraded. Great question. There's another question. I have a question online too. Yes. Um, Matthew Can, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, so um, I actually had to look it up and get the full official name, which it's not the Outer Space Treaty. It's formally the Treaty of Principles Governing the Activities of States in the Exploration and Use of Outer Space, including the Moon and other celestial bodies. And according to this treaty, which this was all the way back in like the 1960s, um, basically everybody agreed that, you know, the moon and other celestial bodies would be, you know, peaceful and, um, be used for peaceful purposes. And I checked China did sign that along with basically everyone else. So is this a major national security issue to be worried about, like competing with China for access to the moon? Yes, because China has declared their intent. Did China specifically say like they want to take over the moon for themselves? Yeah. Okay. Yes. In interesting to hear that. So, all right. Other questions in here? Yes. Um, what's the goal if we beat China to the moon? Are we going to claim it as our own, or oh, keep it to status quo, United Nations, to the to the treaty that was just discussed? And that's why you have all the international partners. Yes. Um, you may have heard of the Chandrayaan-3 mission from Israel that was just a recent success. So is there any plan including Israel into this international space station that's happening on the moon? So I thought they were already part of the, um, so there's the Artemis Accords. So if someone online can go look, there's a whole series of uh, countries that have signed the Artemis Accords. That would be where I would look. Uh, but uh, Israel's been to the ISS is what I believe. And that the whole model of the Artemis Accords were based upon the International uh, Space Station and that. Oh, sorry, the Indians. Yes, I, I would go check as well, though. Right. I actually went to, uh, to how I actually went to their facility in Bangalore. Um, I have one. Nathan Q. Yeah, so I had a question about like SpaceX. So what relation does SpaceX Starship Super Heavy and 
the Starship Lunar Lander have with Artemis's mission and its sustained lunar outposts? Yeah, so SpaceX will have the first lunar lander, and it actually looks kind of like their rocket configuration, and they will put that in orbit. So this is on Artemis 3. If I go back to this one right here. So this NASA graphic doesn't highlight that it is actually the SpaceX lunar lander. Uh, SpaceX will launch that, go put it in orbit, in that orbit that you see here, and then Orion will show up. They will mate, right? And then SpaceX, you know how they can have their uh, boosters land back? They're going to replicate that, but with the, um, the astronauts on board. And then it will be able to take off. NASA just put on contract with um, what was called the national team, Jeff Bezos, will uh, is on contract with Draper and many others to build the sustained lunar lander, which is depicted in notionally in this picture here. So we'll actually have, it's pretty cool, Elon Musk building one lunar lander and Jeff Bezos building the other. Because they're, they're actually in a pretty good competition amongst themselves. Jeff Bezos also building, there's a lot of stuff I could tell you about space. I showed you that spacecraft landing, right? That goes to the international, that's the Dream Chaser, goes to the International Space Station if they hold schedule this, this December. Jeff Bezos, um, is building a space station. So when the International Space Station decommissions, which it will, it's going to reach an end of life, um, there will be commercial space stations. And right now, Jeff Bezos is the one who's leading the pack. I believe it's called Orbital Reef. And they're in partnership, with, again, with Sierra Space. And that spacecraft that looked like a replacement for the shuttle, sole purpose is to resupply both um, humans as well as cargo. Yeah. Uh, um, what's the difference between, you know, the United States setting standards from on the moon and China setting standards on the moon? Um, I, so it's not the United States; it's the international community. And again, the international community has set the standards, and the expectation is is that the international community abides by the standards that the international community set. So it's not the U.S. versus China; it is we're part of an international coalition that is looking to ensure that uh, the moon is used by all international stakeholders. Does Draper do any work for the Mars rovers? Um, we, are, we have some uh, guidance support for uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, but for the most part, um, that has not been bread and butter uh, for Draper, the rover side. Um, how expensive is the whole Artemis, like, till 11? How expensive I don't know. is the estimate? But that, I think uh, you could do a web search and get a number pretty quickly on that. It's, well, as you can imagine, it's not cheap. Um, and, you know, if you take a look at all of these different space agencies here involved, right, all of these, all these nations are putting money into this. So it's not, again, it's not a U.S. thing. Right, U.S. probably dominates the amount of uh, money put into it, though. Okay, um, I'm looking at the watch here, and we do have to cover something important here, and that is what Draper does for its educational mission. So I talked about the four national security areas, but Draper is a nonprofit. Their job is for educational uh, missions. So I got a quick video, I believe, and then I want to talk about opportunities for you. At Draper, we're investing in the future and helping the next innovator, scientist, and engineer to go beyond boundaries. With an educational mission built on success, we partner with colleges and universities to provide the next generation a pathway so they can discover the best solutions to help protect our nation and solve humanity's greatest challenges. Building on our legacy, we offer experience, education, and guidance. Through our Draper Scholars Program, now in its 50th year, we support more than 1,300 graduate students pursuing advanced engineering and science degrees. Our cooperative education program allows students to interact with national experts in numerous fields of research. 
and work with state-of-the-art equipment on real-world technical applications. And our intern program provides undergraduate and graduate students with meaningful engineering experiences, as well as veterans who are transitioning to civilian life, supporting various projects, expanding real-world knowledge, solving complex issues. Okay, this is what you want to take a picture of. We have this summer 200 interns and co-ops. So it's a pretty small laboratory. That's a lot of interns and co-ops. Um, you've got the timeline here. At graduation, we'll be handing out six to eight guaranteed internships for next summer. It's based upon how you're doing in your projects. So your project leads will be coming forward and telling us who uh, should be receiving these, but that'll happen at graduation. But I would encourage everyone here, right, as you become a rising um, freshman to apply, right? The fact that you're in this program and what you learn in this program and what you all the investments you've made to get to this point, you can absolutely work at Draper. I can tell you that. Now, let's get past your undergrad and then let's go to the next step. So we currently fund about 75 masters and PhD students, no strings attached. These are not Draper employees. These are people who are, have a passion for national security. And in doing so, we are planning on growing this program to 250 masters and PhD students annually. We have two with us in race car too. And so, as you go throughout your educational career, and again, it does not matter what you do, right? If you go on to come work for Draper, that's great. But if you're working for um, a biotech company, if you're working, if you're in the military, if you're working at a Lockheed or Raytheon, and you want to get your advanced degrees in national security, you're going to go to our webpage and apply as well. But what we're doing here, and we've got a very strong rec track record, is we want to have 500 students per year in our laboratory. We benefit greatly from it because we get new ideas, new approaches. We get the crazy ideas, right, that people are questioning, you know, that silly cartoon I showed. But the whole premise of what Draper is doing is that we've got nine decades of just absolute breakthrough innovations, and it only comes from people like you. Yep, I'll, I'll cycle back to it. I'm almost there. So when I give my speeches at Draper, Draper's got this phenomenal past. But my real question here is that who's going to come up with the great next invention? And that's the challenge. So back to the question about what do I do as a CEO? My job is to create a laboratory and a climate where people who actually work, because I don't, people who really work can go fill in those question marks. So I challenge all of you, if you would like a job at the laboratory, you should apply. You should do really good in your projects right now, right? Because they're watching, right? And when you get to grad school, which I suspect many of you will, right? If you want to work in national security, we can actually help fund your grad school. All right, um, and clearly we're gonna go to Mars. All right, now questions. Rising seniors. So the questions are, if you're not a rising senior, should they not apply? Oh, we, we take actually, if you meet criteria, uh, we will actually take high school interns as well. Um, each state has their their there's labor laws that go that go into play here. But at the end of the day, so how many people are using MATLAB in here? Show of hands. MATLAB. How many people are coding in Python? All right. So if you were in control systems, if you were working like the UAV, you'd be in. Um, so that's a skill set that's not very common in high school, but we use a lot of that. 
we wouldn't have a problem finding. So even if you're not a rising senior now, rising junior, uh, even below, if you've got uh, some math courses under your belt and you can code and do stuff like that, then we're going to be looking for high school interns as well. So, so I want to remind you, so Draper just offered six to eight internship positions for BWSI alums next summer. And the application process is next like we can have, and the selection decision will be announced at the final event. I just want you to be aware of that. And a uh, quick question, will it be in person? So the, is it be mostly in Cambridge based or will it be based on- In, in one of the, the campuses. Okay, so keep that in mind. You're not restricted to Cambridge. You have to be a US citizen. Thank you, Jerry. What's your name? Uh, Sanan. Sanan? Yes. Hi. I'm Avika. Avika, nice to meet you. Hi, we just wanted to thank you so much for coming here and giving us such a great presentation about the impact Draper had on things like the moon landing and the cure for cancer, which has really influenced our world. And it's really cool to think how close the future is. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Me, I want to talk about your investment in education, which I find is the best thing about your company and how you're trying to future. Basically, focus on the future and not let the past hold you down. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Here's what my plan was. So if I go back and sit in the chairs that you're sitting in today, uh, my game plan was I was going to be an astronaut. To be an astronaut, I was going to be a fighter pilot. Right? To be a fighter pilot, I needed to go to an engineering school and get good grades because at the time, my high school grades were really bad and there was no way I was going to make it to a service academy. And so, uh, so I started going to school, become an aerospace engineer, to become a fighter pilot. And then the biggest event in my lifetime, the Berlin Wall fell. That's again, how old I am. And our military did not need fighter pilots. They actually cut half of the, um, there was a 60% reduction in this industry at that time. And there were no fighter pilot slots for even those that graduated from the academies. Such is life. I was just born the wrong year. Had I been born five years earlier or five years later, who knows? I think I would have made a great pilot, right? I think I would have been a great astronaut. Um, I did take my aptitude test. And uh, when my 28th birthday came about and I was no longer able to be a fighter pilot because that's when you age out, that was a rough birthday, but such is life. So who knows, right? Um, I would caution all of you to have that very firm timetable in mind because life is life and just roll with the punches and wherever it takes you, embrace the opportunity that's presented and go with it. Question? Um, I'll come um, to you next. Um, how does one get to the uh, position you're at now uh, as a CEO of Draper? Um, I'm gonna say 50% 50, 50 luck, 50% is just working really hard. Um, don't ever forget the 50% luck portion, right? Life, life is about a probability distribution. You can work your ass off to control that distribution one way or the other. At the end of the day, it's still a roll of the dice and you got to recognize that. So you get to this roll here, you can't sit back and say, yeah, I was really, you know, great. I was smart. I worked hard, da, 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 right? And some people get, you know, their heads kind of get a little big. Never, ever forget 50% of this is pure random roll of the dice. Hi. So um, I was wondering, since Draper is a nonprofit organization, uh, where do you secure your funding and, like, who are like the people that fund Draper's initiatives and like scientific developments? Yeah, so 
Draper, in fact, operates no differently than a Raytheon, a Lockheed, a Boeing, a Northrop Grumman. We're a nonprofit. We charge profit on all of our contracts. And we operate in contract just like the rest of the defense and industrial base. However, we get to take all the profit dollars and put it back to investment. So in my prior job, half of the money we generated, we had to hand over to um, corporate headquarters that then handed it off to shareholders at Draper. We get to keep that to have better technology, better facilities, better business tools, and invest in our people. So DARPA, NASA, Navy, Air Force, you name it. Great question. Hold, hold. Hello. What guiding principles do you use to lead your own children? So, uh, I, so I'm very simple, open, honest, and consistent. That's the way I conduct myself in the business world. That's the way I conduct myself at home. Um, but, you know, kids are kids. I have three teenagers. And, uh, you know, at, when you become a teenager, I'm sure you guys didn't do this to your parents, but your parents become, you, you transition from parents that are some of the, you know, you look up to them, you admire them, to now they're probably, they don't know anything about life. So I'm in that stage. My oldest is 21. My youngest is 14. And um, so we're in that stage, but I maintain my open, honest, consistent, my level of honesty and consistency in my honesty uh, is probably not embraced as much by my kids, but at a certain point, they still have to hear it. Yes. I was wondering, what do you look for when you hire like new researchers? Like, is it just if you get a PhD, like boom, you're in if you apply, or is it more nuanced than that? All right, great question. Um, when I did uh, the second, so I've worked in a lot of different places. In my second startup company, I went and built a team from scratch. It's one of the speeches I've given here many times about autonomy. I built a team based upon resumes. The wall that right. What school you went to, what was your GPA, who was your professor, so on. And that team all put together really sucked. So what I learned was is that actually where you go to college, the GPA you get is kind of like the beginning of a conversation. It's not the end of the conversation. So what do I look for today? Well, I work in the defense industrial base. I have spent 32 years focused on national security and defending democracy. So when I recruit people, I want to know whether or not they're patriotic and whether or not they want to support national security. Two, especially in a high-end R&D organization, imagination. Are you willing to dream something that is crazy? Because the premise that I've stood in here many, many times, if someone can dream it, it's doable. Time and time again, crazy dreams have become a reality. So the academics, table stakes. I'm now looking for the person who can dream big and be willing to go put the effort in to make that dream a reality. All right, top row now. All right, we've made it up there. Uh, how did you get to where you are today and what opportunities and risks do you feel enabled you to get to where you are today? All right. Um, so where did I get to today? Uh, first, I had a big. So again, this is one of the speeches I've given uh, this audience over over the years, different group, clearly. So first and foremost, have a big dream. Right. So again, I told you I wanted to be an astronaut. Am I an astronaut? Nope. Right. But it was a big dream. And my premise here, play, play uh, long ball. You play short ball. You're going to sh uh, show up with short dreams. Two. Take, take the opportunities that are presented to you. The timing will always suck. It will never be right. But when you're given an opportunity, don't say no to the gift horse. Three, leave comfort zones. If you're comfortable where you're at, so you're, you guys are going to go to college, you know, rising seniors, pretty soon you're going on to college, right? You will leave a comfort zone. You will leave home. You're going to go to an environment 
that is going to be probably scary, a little homesick, but you are going to grow as a person. When you get comfortable, don't stop thinking about that experience. So what I've done to be in this job here is I have gone from job to job to job, sometimes within a company, sometimes between companies. But the jobs I went after were the jobs that no one else wanted. Those were the jobs that were where failure was highly probable, which takes me to my fourth one. And that is you better find experiences to fail early. And I've got this picture where I show a little kid on ice skates falling on the ice. And it's much better to fall on the ice the younger you are than waiting to you're in the Olympics and you've been so perfect throughout your career and then you fall, right? If you go and research great leaders in history and I, I'm, you go back over 2000 years, what you'll see is they all experienced major failures in their lifetimes, if not multiple times, and then rebounded. So especially when you're without families, right? Go after the hard experiences, experience failure. Very little learning happens from winning. Most of your learning comes from failing. So don't hesitate to fail. All right. Yes. I'm just wondering about Draper. Um, does Draper do research into things like, say, psychology, economics, public policy, or is it all sort of, I guess, engineering, computer science focused stuff? We're going to talk about that in my presentation. Thank you. Yeah.